Hello and welcome everyone. I am Erin Mackay, Managing Director for Health Justice at the National Partnership for Women and Families. We are so thrilled that you've joined us today for our video webinar on building the health equity virtuous cycle. We've got a great cross sector of leaders and advocates and decision makers and researchers in the virtual room with us today. It's been really exciting to see registrations come in from all across the health ecosystem with people working at the federal, state and local levels. We intend for this webinar to be interactive, so please engage in the Zoom chat to share questions and comments with speakers and each other. Um, and I wanna start by giving you just a brief sense of what's to come in the next hour. We are going to kick it off with a preview of our new tools and resources. Then we'll do a deeper dive into the background and context that has shaped this project. Um, I wanna offer a uh, case study, a little example, how we think this tool could be used to, um, to advance health equity and policy and practice. And then finally, we will open it up for your reactions, feedback, and questions. We're really eager to hear what you think of these tools, and we're hoping for a robust discussion and Q&A session for the last 20 minutes of our hour. Before the sneak preview, I'd like to acknowledge and appreciate the people that have made this event possible. I want to especially thank the experts and advisors that have shaped the concept and refinement of these tools. First and foremost, the Project Advisory Council, a group of patients, caregivers, consumer advocates, healthcare providers, and other thought leaders that have brought subject matter expertise on health equity, patient and family-centered care, mental health, quality improvement, among many other issues. So we're thrilled to have several council members joining um, us today, and we look forward to hearing from you later in the hour. I also want to thank our additional advisors, um, Ayadola Anise from the National Academy of Medicine and Joshua Trailer from the Healthcare Transformation Task Force, who provided invaluable um, insights and advice and support as we uh, built this concept out. I'd also like to thank the National Partnership team members, some of whom you will see in the next hour, but many more who have provided um, invaluable support to bring you what you are going to see today. And finally, we want to acknowledge that this work would not have been possible without an engagement award from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI. So now to give you a virtual tour of our new Choosing Health Equity landing page, I'm going to toss it to Danny Gillespie, Health Justice Policy Associate and Project Co-Creator. Hi folks, I'm Danny Gillespie from the National Partnership, and I am so excited to showcase our interactive Choosing Health Equity Decision Points tool. COVID has really underscored the urgency of advancing health equity, and we've created this resource to help do so. So let's get into it. You're gonna want to navigate to the landing page, nationalpartnership.org forward slash Choosing Health Equity. And then visit the interactive tool page. Okay, so next you select the stakeholder perspective that describes you. And the perspective you choose is going to dictate the list of questions and recommendations that you see in the rest of this interactive tool. So it's very much a choose your own adventure uh, moment um, because you are all health leaders in policy and practice. I'm gonna choose the decision maker and advocate route. And then I'm directed to the next question. I can choose next if it's clear to me why this is an important equity decision point, um, or I can click tell me more if additional information and recommendations um, about why and how to advance health equity would be helpful. Okay, so then you continue through the tool, um, servicing additional equity choice points and recommendations. So when I finish navigating all of the questions and tell me more and recommendations, I click submit and I'm taken to a thank you page, uh, at which point I can 
go back to the landing page. Um, and on this page, I can download a full list of questions and recommendations from the researcher's perspective, from the decision maker and advocate's perspective. If I want to dig deeper into the resources we use to develop this suite of tools, I can access the resource directory. Um, and I can also read a blog post um, by one of the patient advocates who helped develop these tools. So now hopefully I've piqued your interest. Thank you very much, Danny. Appreciate that sneak preview. Um, before we move on, I wanted to say a few words about the National Partnership for Women and Families. So the National Partnership is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization located in the nation's capital of Washington, DC. And we've been working for 50 years to improve life for women and their families advocating for workplace and economic equity that includes um, uh, high quality affordable health care up that upholds women's reproductive rights and health. We are so excited to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. And as we've reached this milestone, we've thought at length about how to evolve our work and this organization to better serve the women and families disadvantaged by structures and systems of oppression. Over the last few years, we've been working in new ways to bring together our different streams of health policy work, maternal health, Affordable Care Act improvements and system transformation, and reproductive health and rights work under a new health justice umbrella, and ensuring that as part of that work, we are integrating intersectional health equity analyses into everything we do. One issue that has been very clear in the past year is that racism is a driver of health inequities and poor health in this country. This Choosing Health Equity Project is another way we're hoping to contribute to the field and ongoing efforts to advance health equity. To share more background and details on our new suite of tools, it's an honor to introduce Cincy Hernandez Cancio, Vice President for Health Justice. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you, Danny, for uh, walking us through how this very cool tool works. We're really excited to share this resource with you. Um, as you know, uh, the National Partnership for Women and Families has been really focused on ensuring that everybody has the ability to achieve the highest level of health, and that really requires a focus on health equity. Uh, that means that we must focus first of all, value everybody equally, focus societal efforts um, to fix avoidable inequalities, address historical and contemporary injustices, and that is how we eliminate health and healthcare disparities. The thing is that this requires intentionality. There are two paths that our society and our healthcare system can take right now. And doing the same thing we have been doing does not work and will not work for uh, ensuring that every single person in this country has the ability to be as healthy as possible. There is a peril and a promise involved. If we continue to do what we're doing right now and, and focus on one size fits all kinds of programs and expect that there's this invisible hand that will work by itself to be able to um, undo the harms and, and the structures that have got us into this position of having such deep health inequities, um, we're going to fail. On the other hand, if we make very, very intentional choices uh, to, to disrupt the standard operating procedure of how our resources when it comes to health and how the risks when it comes to health risks are distributed in this country, then we can actually proactively and affirmatively uh, end up uh, making the choices that need to be made to ensure that everybody is as healthy as possible and that we are able to have a healthy, vibrant country and a healthy, vibrant economy. So right now, there is an incredible amount of attention and urgency around ensuring that we choose this right path, the path towards health equity. First, uh, it's very clear that health that healthcare inequities and health inequities are extremely in expensive for this country. Not only is there the moral cost of the lives lost 
and the shortened, and especially the shortened lives. There are also incredibly high costs for the healthcare system, broader economic costs of lost productivity, and, and estimates show that if we fix health inequities right now, uh, by 2050, we'll have we will have saved more than 200 billion yearly for our economy. In addition to that, another imperative is a demographic imperative. Today, most of our children, more than half, are kids of color. And by 2045, the majority of people in this country, and a bit earlier, the majority of the workforce of this country is gonna be from black, indigenous, and other people of color in this country. So it is extremely important that we understand that we have 10 or 15 years to get this right so that the kids of today are able to be truly, um, to, are able to thrive and be truly uh, productive, contributing members that this society and this economy needs. In addition to that, over the last year and few months, there is an even more urgent uh, priority, and that is the addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased the stakes around health equity even more, especially as we saw how uh, terrible the disparate outcomes were when it came to Black and Latino and Indigenous populations, um, and how that intersects with who we see and need as essential workers in this economy. And so it became painfully clear to more people than ever that these essential workers, primarily people of color, uh, need to be treated as essential and not just expendable workers um, that we are not taking care of. So one of the things that the National Partnership has been really focused on is ensuring that we are understanding the intersecting effects of racism and misogyny, you know, uh, racial discrimination and gender discrimination, and how that is impacting particularly women of color and their families. To go through this kind of quickly, uh, this is a slide that is trying to show all the different ways that these particular issues interact. On the one hand, we have to start on a foundational basis with understanding interpersonal racism and systemic racism. Both uh, have intense effects on uh, the outcome, the, the, the well being and health outcomes of communities of color. Uh, systemic racism includes uh, the kinds of discrimination and racism that we find in particular institutions, which can range from you know, government entities and hospitals and uh, universities and educational institutions, for example. And structural racism means the kind of policies and practices that are embedded uh, across the entirety of our society that systematically have privileged some peoples and some communities with more uh, positive opportunities to be healthy, more health and healthcare assets, and less risk. And on the other hand, have, in, in, have uh, uh, directed more healthcare risks and fewer healthcare assets to communities of color. On top of that, there is a layer of interpersonal racism, which includes both implicit bias that we all have, including healthcare providers, uh, and also explicit bigotry that we have seen um, on our TV screens uh, in the last, you know, for, for years and years now, especially more acutely in the last couple of years, and also explicit bigotry that we know exists in the healthcare system itself. These uh, levels of racism inter, uh, basically determine uh, what a lot of people call the social determinants of health. Because these political, this is all about politics and power in these decisions about the conditions of where people bo are born, grow, live, learn, work, play, and pray that really do influence uh, how much health opportunity versus how much health risk people and communities have. And these social determinants of health influence and determine both uh, health inequities as, where, as well as health care inequities. 
moving toward the right side, it's important to understand that these, uh, the, that racism specifically has a very clear physiological, in other words, the physical effect on people's body based on the toxic stress and increased allostatic load of having to live in a country uh, where you are going to be subjected to micro and macro aggressions on a practically daily basis. And that together with these more structural uh, uh, determinants of health that produce healthcare inequities and health inequities all come, to get, come together to have a very, very severe and negative impact for women of color. So that has brought us to why we're here today, which is how do we disrupt this? Like we saw that very complex system of reinforcing structures that consistently uh, damage the health of women of color and people of color and their families. And so how do we go from the standard operating procedure that has gotten us to this mess to a different future where we can be very intentional about undoing this damage. We are thrilled to introduce a suite of tools and resources designed specifically to disrupt the standard process and to center equity. By posing questions to consider and providing very specific recommendations and resources for stakeholders to apply, we wanna make it easier for people to choose health equity, whatever their role is in the health and healthcare ecosystem. So this includes the what, the questions. It is directed at researchers, decision makers, and advocates so that we can truly disrupt uh, standard operating processes so that we can achieve a much healthier, more equitable, and just society. And we do this by surfacing the multiple decision points in the cycle of health evidence and healthcare policy development and implementation so that everyone can choose health equity. So, uh, sorry about that. Um, so what, this, what these tools should produce is to make sure that instead of continuing to do what we're doing, which is really worsening health outcomes for people, to make sure that we are building uh, a health equity virtuous cycle that continuously reinforces strategies to identify the drivers of, of inequities and to develop solutions to dismantle them. We do this by surfacing critical decision points so we aren't racing to the bottom, but instead are building pathways that spiral up in a virtuous cycle. And one of the things that's important um, about this cycle is that you'll see that there are uh, on the one hand, questions uh, that uh, have to do with the research that is uh, basically providing the evidence and the information needed to make better decisions, as well as the decision makers and the advocates that use this information and evidence to develop better programs and policies and practices. And as you can see, this illustration shows that there is a definite cycle where you start with defining research questions and doing the studies and having the evidence base and analyzing it and then sharing those results that then the decision makers and advocates take those results so to better understand the problems and the drivers of the inequities to design better policies and programs, adopt and implement them and then evaluate the impact because there are always unintended consequences. And that in turn helps build what are the continuing uh, next level research questions that need to be addressed and around and round the cycle goes. One important point to underscore is that depending on who you are in the healthcare and health ecosystem, you may start at any point of these circles, right? Like if you're a researcher, um, who is really focused on the analysis, or if you are a researcher that works on um, implementation science and sharing results, you might be starting in different points of this cycle. Similarly, same thing with decision makers or advocates, right? Um, decision makers may be in the process, for example, of designing policies, and then advocates need to assess them to see, you know, if they're the kinds of policies and if any adjustments need to be made. 
and so forth. So that takes us, let's, let's focus very specifically on the right side of this, um, of this graphic, which is for decision makers and advocates. So here are more specifically the different stages. First, we need to understand the problem. And some of the questions that we ask is, does the problem as defined prioritize an issue that people and communities care about, right? It needs to be something that is important and, and a high priority for them. And number two, does it address racial, ethnic, and gender health inequities as defined by those communities? Then you get to the design and assess phase. First of all, you need to be very clear that the goals, what are the outcomes that you're trying to reach are very, very clearly defined. You need to ensure that the people and communities that are most affected, like closest to the pain, are included in solving the problem, in designing what it is that they need. Number three, we need to address these, whatever barriers are facing these structurally disadvantaged communities, right? Uh, we need to be very specific and concrete about addressing these, bar these, these obstacles so that you can create systems of opportunity. And fourth, you need to address differences in community level factors, right? It's not just how an individual family or an individual um, is, is experiencing their health, but so much has to do with socially determined factors that you really need to look at those community level factors. Next, you work on adopting and implementing the policy or practice. And you need to make sure that the implementation is actually tailored to the communities most in need. And that includes that you have to have dedicated funding for tailoring and tailoring the design and dissemination of the policy. Second, you need to make sure that the most affected people and communities are partners in that implementation, right? You can't just parachute into a community and expect people to, to trust and understand what you're trying to, to do. You need to make sure that you're partnering with people that already have the trust of the community and you need to pay them to do it, right? These are under-resourced communities and it is not fair or effective um, to expect them to be able to do it without resources. And finally, you need to evaluate your impact because there are always gonna be unintended consequences. So you need to make sure that that evaluation includes measures of impact on equity. You need to make sure that communities are involved in the evaluation, right? Because they're going to be able to see things in, in a perspective of what it is like on the ground um, that researchers and policymakers and even advocates may fail to see. You need to make sure that there is a plan to refine the program or policy to address whatever gaps are uncovered by this evaluation. And there needs to be a plan to communicate the results with the affected communities and advocates so that we can all work together to, to develop, first of all, you know, ensure that there are next level research questions to try to solve some of the gaps that were uncovered and also uh, better, you know, any kinds of um, amendments or tailoring of the policies to address some of these concerns. And so this is, these are, this is, is the specific example of how by asking questions at different stages of the policy and practice development and implementation process, we can do a much better job of centering addressing inequities by asking and surfacing the right questions. Thank you so much, Cincy. Um, as Cincy described, you know, asking questions is a really important uh, part of this process, but the questions alone will, will not suffice. We wanted to also, in this new suite of tools, um, provide some resources and recommendations for folks to um, maybe not be able to answer the specific question that they have based on their particular research study or healthcare policy or program that they are building or um, evaluating, but have a little bit more context and background to understand the question and how to respond to it. So I wanna point out another really important feature of these choosing health equity tools, which are the recommendations and resources that are captured in the tell me more statements that Danny previewed in the interactive tool earlier. These recommendations are meant to provide background and context, as I mentioned, helping people understand why that question represents an important equity choice point and offering examples to ground the recommendations in real world scenarios. 
So you see on your screen here one example of, a, of a, the tell me more statement that is paired with the, one of the questions Cincy highlighted around understanding the particular um, barriers that disadvantaged communities may face um, when it comes to benefiting from a particular program or policy. So I, I think what I would like to say about these tell me more statements is, is as you'll see, they're relatively short. They are meant to provide a snapshot response to give folks, an, again, an, uh, an idea of why they are important. I also want to point out that each statement draws from the best available evidence related to health equity, patient and community engagement, and health system transformation. We are, um, and, and this work in general is, is um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. We are, these are our contributions to a robust and growing field of work in this area. Um, but the resources that we draw on to craft these tell me more statements, along with other foundational research and thought leadership pieces are compiled in the resource directory um, that, that you may have seen on the landing page earlier. So in case you want to dig more um, and learn, uh, dig a little bit deeper and learn more, those resources are available for you to do so. So moving on, we thought that it would be helpful as, as you know, before we open it up for discussion and reaction to this tool to work with a specific example. So think about how this tool could affect change in the way that healthcare research and programs and policy are currently being um, designed and implemented. Of course, um, we're biased, but we think these tools will be helpful in many scenarios. But one of the most salient issues or examples right now is the coronavirus and specifically COVID-19 vaccination efforts. So what would it look like to apply the questions that are asked in these um, choosing health equity resources and the relevant recommendations to current vaccine rollout programs and plans? Um, we're especially mindful of this uh, here in the Washington DC area since early data show significant racial inequities in vaccination rates, um, particularly among black and, La black and Latinx residents of the District of Columbia, Maryland and Virginia, the DMV area. So moving on, uh, you know, we, we showed you one of those um, uh, tell me more statements and that tell me more statement specifically highlighted a couple of barriers um, that communities face. So we wanted to highlight and pull out some of those barriers here as we think through again, how this might, these tools might be useful to vaccine rollout efforts. Um, so some, some of the barriers that we called out were lack of transportation, um, the uh, inability to take time off work, so the lack of paid sick days or, or leave in general for people to stand in line, either a real line or a virtual line in order to make a vaccination appointment or actually receive the shot. I think um, uh, limited English proficiency is another important issue, especially when you think about um, uh, educational materials, websites, um, and again, just the, the, the places where you're going to make, uh, to schedule appointments. Is that information, are those scheduling appointments available in non-English languages? Um, and then another important issue is technology access. We know that digital access has been particularly crucial in the uh, quarantine age of the coronavirus. And many states and local health departments are using electronic systems called portals where register, residents can register online or by phone on a first come first serve basis. But of course, reliable access to computers and Wi-Fi, as well as the digital literacy and the digital skills necessary to navigate these websites are challenges for many. This is why, as Cincy mentioned, um, policy and research must include affected people and communities and partners uh, in, in, as implementation partners, including paying them for their time and effort so that um, communities and people can help surface these barriers and problem solve solutions to address them. It's also why evaluation efforts must include measures of impact on equity, including unintended consequences. 
a really good example that I'd like to share of, of unintended consequences and the power of this kind of evaluation comes from um, a lo local direct service organization here in Washington, D.C., Bread for the City. Um, they are a community-based organization providing food, clothing, medical care, legal counsel, um, and other vital social services to D.C. residents living with low incomes. And around the time we were finalizing these choosing health equity tools and, and thinking about how to bring them to life with a case study, uh, the CEO of Bread, and, Bread for the City published an op-ed in the Washington Post about the incredible work that his work is doing to administer vaccinations. Um, just as a, as a quick sort of real life uh, example, um, the, the op-ed chronicles just the experience of Bread for the City serving as a vaccination site. And while they um, typically 80% uh, of the 35,000 DC residents that they serve each year are black, when they started scheduling vaccination appointments, they noticed that by and large, those slots were getting filled up with white vaccine recipients. So after a lot of um, uh, thinking and analysis, they ended up opting out of the online vaccination registration portal and, and reverting back to direct community and patient outreach um, to bring in residents for vaccinations. And in just a few weeks, they saw a dramatic difference. While uh, it, with their first couple of weeks using the online portal, 22% of vaccinations were given to Black individuals. Two weeks after they opted out of the portal, that number rose to 75%. So again, this is just another example of trying to um, proactively identify both barriers and solutions to overcoming them. In this op-ed, um, Mr. Jones reflects on the organization's efforts and experience and lessons learned, and there is so much to take away from the work that his organization has done. But I think especially in his sort of encapsulation or articulation of the imperative to choose health equity and vaccine distribution. He notes, racial equity and vaccine distribution is possible, but it must be actively pursued. And I think the key words there are actively, this idea that we have to, um, that, that advancing health equity is a work of action, uh, something that we must do over and over again. So I think moving ahead, it is our hope that these choosing health equity tools will help decision makers and advocates and researchers in that active pursuit of um, identifying and dismantling um, inequities and really advancing health equity. And we are hopeful that asking questions and proactively surfacing these kinds of decision points, as well as providing the support and resources and tools to understand how to choose differently will be helpful to the field, um, especially as we are building back in the, um, the wake of uh, the last year. So thank you all again for joining us. We are really excited um, to hear what you, th what you think. Um, we are hopeful to be able to continue to refine these tools. Um, so if you have not already, I haven't been able to do that many things at once, but please put any questions or comments in the chat. We'll be, um, Danny and Nikita will be moderating those and, and bringing in uh, questions for discussion. But first, I would love to pitch it to some of our advisory council members, if they are on the line with us today, just to share their reactions and experiences um, working on this project. So Earl Shellner is a patient advocate that is, sits on our project advisory Council and wrote an amazing blog post um, about these tools and, and why and how he thinks they'll be useful. So Earl, if you are with us, I would um, love to pitch it over to you to, to hear what you think. Oh, uh, Hi. Hello. Hey. You guys see me now? Uh, hey, how you doing, Aaron? First of all, I just wanted to say great presentation. Um, that was really amazing. It hit on all the points we discussed on before, um, especially like the part about having the ref recommendations, as we mentioned before. That's the most important thing. It's easy to come up with the questions, but the hard part is the answers. Um, so I think that was very well done, and I just hope we are able to convince other healthcare organizations to use this tool because that stat you just gave about 
the vaccines for Washington, D.C., when 80 percent of their patients are usually African-American, but only 22 percent were signing up for the vaccine and then jumping that number up to 75 percent two weeks after taking off. That is just proof right there that these are the kind of things that have to be changed. They have to realize in healthcare, if you don't can't afford high-speed internet or if you can't afford a laptop or a smartphone, there's no way you're going to be able to sign up for these portals. Uh, for vaccine. It's the same way with the health portals. Uh, a lot of the information I have from my hospital is relies on my health portal through my chart. And once again, if you don't have access to these devices or the services to get it, you can't uh, communicate through those portals with your doctor. So I just think this is what we really need right now. Uh, and that's what we mentioned on in the blog. Just this is the kind of stuff we need right now to help make these changes for health equity. Yeah, thank you so much for those comments, Earl, and for all of your work on this project. Um, next, I want to uh, throw it over to a question from Maddie Reiner, who is another one of our advisory council members. Um, Maddie says, how will you drive people to use this tool? Is there a way to partner with organizations that fund research that their researchers have to go through this process? Maddie, thank you so much for the question. Um, I, were you trying to say something else? I'm sorry if I cut you off. So hard to tell in this Zoom environment. Um, so Maddie, thank you for the question and for again being part of the advisory council. Um, love the question about how we plan to um, to get these to get these tools out into the world. Uh, this was our first step: is showcasing it um, with advocates and experts and leaders in the field like you all. Uh, I think we have we've gotten a lot of really um, robust um, excitement and feedback on the tool thus far from different organizations. Again, at, at all levels of the healthcare ecosystem that see this as useful, and so we will be working to do a little, you know a little bit of a mini roadshow in the coming weeks and months, just um, offering a similar presentation to organizations that want to learn more um, and working with organizations that might be interested to um, leverage their, their, their networks and their contacts. But Danny or, or Cincy, if you're with us, happy to uh, welcome you to chime in here as well. Um, I'm going to chime in with another question. Uh, this one comes from Joshua Trailer, who um, gave us a lot of wonderful insights in this tool development as well. Joshua says, um, regarding vaccine efforts, do you have any thoughts or advice about how state and federal actors trying to control rollouts and promote vaccination efforts can work with and not inadvert inadvertently impede effective community le lead community-led efforts? Um, and are there any key lessons you would apply from these tools? So thank you, Josh. Appreciate that question. I think I might um, answer them in the reverse order, which is to first say that I, we have not yet gathered any lessons from the, the use, utilization, or implementation of these, these tools since we are just releasing them um, and rolling them out. So we are eager to hear people's feedback as they start to use them, um, how, they, how they find them useful. Um, but I think I can say briefly, just in terms of um, collaborating and, and contributing or adding to community-led efforts rather than replacing them, I'm happy to say something and then Cincy may want to, to join in here. Uh, but I think one thing we've learned from our work is the importance of um, uh, acknowledging and celebrating community expertise and assets. There are leaders, in the, uh, individual leaders and organizations in the communities that have been doing um, successful community outreach and engagement and improving health and healthcare for years and uh, finding a way to, to, to to celebrate and lift up the success that they have had um, and when possible contribute to that in some way rather than replacing it with um, uh, solutions sort of from the, from the top down rather than the, uh, a coll more collaborative approach is something we've learned is effective. But Cincy, I see you've taken yourself off mute. Would you like to weigh in here? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you've all done a great job and thank you for joining us 
um, today. I hope that you are hearing me. And I apologize for not being on screen. You know, case in point, I actually got my second dose of the COVID vaccine yesterday, and I'm not completely feeling great. So um, bear with me. I'm just so excited to be able to share this tool um, with all of you. I think one of the most important things for people to think about as like it, with vaccines being one example, but more broadly, is that there's a lot of conversation happening right now about what some people call hesitancy and what we like to call um, building more confidence. Um, because it's there's a lot of conversation about how communities, you know, are not, especially communities of color, have real questions about who to trust and how to trust um, medical establishments and medical research, um, including, you know, taking a using a vaccine. Um, and I think that we need to flip that question. Um, there are really good reasons, historical and contemporary, why uh, people of color may have uh, questions about who and when to trust the medical establishment. And so part of what needs to happen is for the medical establishment and research to be trustworthy and that it's a mutual relationship, right? We need to trust community, then we need to trust patients and individuals as the experts of their own lives and their own situations. Um, and so part of that means that you need to be very, uh, very active and affirmative in seeking out the leaders in communities in making sure that you're including patient voices in all stages, which is what we hope that this tool will help um, facilitate um, and that you are actually resourcing that expertise, right? There are different kinds of expertise and lived experience in knowing how to manage uh, you know, and navigate barriers in a community is a very, very valuable and important level of expertise um, that must be acknowledged and actively resourced and partnered with in order to be successful. And that's what we saw, the, the Bradford the, the City example is a great illustration of that, right? That they then worked with uh, other people in the community to go door to door um, and, and establish why it's so important and, and provide the assistance on the ground to be able um, to get to that amazing goal of getting more people who are the most affected and the most likely to have adverse outcomes from COVID to get the, the, the vaccine. Um, I hope that is just one illustration and one way um, to help answer that question. And I really do encourage all of you um, to spend some time on the tool and uh, send us your, your feedback uh, because this is just a first step for us. We really do hope um, to have the resources to continue to iterate and improve this tool um, and to disseminate it further. Back to you, Erin. Thanks, Cincy. Danny, what do you see coming in um, in the chat? So um, I see a question from Matt. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to, we can take you off mute so you can ask your question with your voice, um, or we can definitely read it from the chat. Um, oh, it's answered. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think, Matt, thank you. I, you're right. We did largely answer um, it with sort of our, our plans and thinking around dissemination. I think, um, you know, the one piece I want to add on based on a, a detail that you pulled out is uh, you referenced all of the other great work that's already out there. And I think, again, it's important to acknowledge that um, these ideas, these concepts are not new. The National Partnership was trying to bring them together in a new way for a new audience, but we are eager to hear um, what additional uh, questions or choice points might be out there, additional resources we should be referencing, um, and, and yeah, looking to sort of collaborate and, and build upon, um, generate a force multiplying factor for all of these great health equity tools. So. Thank you for the question. Erin, I guess kind of building on that, um, Emma had a question, Emma Flores had a question. Um, do you see the choosing health equity tool as a first step in a greater transformation of the healthcare system? 
Yes, Emma, thank you so much for that question. And I'm happy to start and, and maybe Cincy or Danny, if you guys want to chime in here, but absolutely, we see this as um, a necessary and important catalyst, um, but it is just the first step in a journey of a thousand or 10,000 miles. Um, we, we as, as Cincy, you know, really described so well, we see helping people understand that the decisions that they make, number one, that they are making decisions because sometimes we just go through the motions in, in sort of um, in the spheres of work that we're, we're, used to, we're, we're used to, whether it's research or policy or advocacy or designing programs, not realizing we're actually making decisions. But I think even more importantly than that, um, recognizing the long-term implications of those decisions, specifically with regard to either advancing health equity or perpetuating um, and entrenching existing barriers and inequities. So yes, we see this as a necessary um, first step step with many to follow. But Cincy, what else would you add? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question, Emma. Um, the national partnership, we were really on the forefront of ensuring that uh, consumer and the patient perspective was part of this larger effort that's been going on for several years now to transform the way healthcare delivered and paid for. And, and it's essential that in doing that, uh, we are centering to make the changes for the benefit of the communities who are continuously and consistently left behind, right? Um, so for us, everything that we do when it comes to our work in health policy, uh, we think it's essential to insert this kind of analysis and ask these questions um, so that as we change the way healthcare is delivered, and we've seen a lot of that in the last year um, because of the COVID pandemic, as we change the way the healthcare is delivered and the resources that are dedicated to them and how they are dedicated to them, um, that we are uh, prioritizing addressing these barriers. And the only way to do that and to make sure that um, you're not inadvertently actually making things worse um, is to ask these questions, to disrupt the usual way of conducting business um, by asking these very, very critical questions and being serious about addressing, um, answering them, and addressing um, the barriers that those answers point to. Thank you, Cincy. Um, I think Josh is just asking all of the all of the super easy questions today. Um, so he asked, uh, "Do you have thoughts on how researchers and policymakers and decision makers?" can more intentionally partner on health equity issues, um, specifically, or for example, in applied research directly supporting decision maker actions using the tool as a guide. Would you like to take that one first, Cincy? Sure, and Josh, thank you for the question. Um, so I think Erin made a, a, an important point about how we are really eager to take this show on the road, albeit virtually. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you are all, you know, we understand that you're all in different parts of this healthcare policy and advocacy um, and delivery ecosystem. And we would love to spend, you know, if you find that this could be a useful framework and a useful tool for the work that you or your organization or those that you work with um, to use, then we would be really excited to partner with you and with those organizations, you know, to share this more broadly, to dive potentially more deeply into some of the questions, the ones that you feel are most um, important or relevant in the work that you're doing, um, and bring to bear uh, not just the expertise of the National Partnership, but the expertise of a lot of the of our partners and our um, in in the various different kind of advisory boards that we're on that 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 share this work with us, um, so that we can help in whatever way we can uh, to refine the work that you are already doing. But the most important question, the most important point is to you know, take a pause, take a pause in whatever work you're doing and ask yourselves these questions um, so that the quality of the work that you're doing can be directly impactful for advancing health equity. 
Great. Thank you, Cincy and, and Josh, again, for such a great question. Um, no other questions have come in the chat, but we wanted to throw it open. First, we wanted to note that the, we've enabled the hand raise function. So if you have a question or a comment to share maybe about something you're working on or a way that you think this tool might be helpful or relevant to your work, we would love to hear about it. Um, but just wanted to open it up one more time for um, questions or comments or, or any other feedback before we close out for the hour. Erin, I do want to address one question that came up in the chat, which is a question of whether there is a fee to use a tool or any of these resources. And the answer is no. Um, that is, uh, we, we all recognize that, you know, resources um, are often a barrier for people to access what they need. And so we did not want to uh, put any additional barriers on using this tool. On the contrary, we want it to be shared as broadly as possible. And again, I wanna reiterate that as you share this and use a tool and share it among your networks, all the feedback that you get about what is working or new ideas of what to add and all of that are things that we are extremely eager to hear um, because we need to change the way business is done when it comes to health policy so that eventually we get to a place where uh, people naturally ask these questions, where decision makers you know, know to not move forward unless they have good answers to these questions. And the only way to do that um, is number one, to share this as broadly as possible. And number two, to continue to refine it and iterate on it based on actual, uh, the feedback from the people who use it. So please feel free to use it as much as possible. It is free and, um, and give us your feedback. Yeah, thank you, Cincy. And Lisa, thank you for the question. Um, I wanted to add on, uh, just in case you, the, you either missed the preview from Danny or it was all new and you weren't exactly sure what you were seeing, we've got a couple of things available on our Choosing Health Equity landing page that you guys can all go and check out in your own time. One is that interactive tool. So if you want to be walking through the questions one by one in real time, sort of choosing your own adventure on the path you wanna start, um, that's, that's an option that's available. We also have downloadable guides. So a downloadable guide for researchers that includes the questions and the tell me more statements um, on that left-hand side of the health equity virtuous cycle and a separate downloadable guide for decision makers and advocates. That's the full list of questions and recommendations for decision makers and advocates that right side of the cycle that Cincy focused on. Um, and then the last thing we have available, again, all for free download is that resource directory. So if um, you are intrigued by any concepts raised or recommendations in those tell me more statements, the, the, the resources to dig more deeply are available. Uh, but Danny, I'll turn it over to you to see where we are with questions. Yeah, thanks, Erin. It looks like Earl Shellner has raised his hand. Earl, um, just going to unmute you. Um, oopsie. Um, and um, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, I just had a quick question. I know you guys just started this and finished this tool. Um, do you have any uh, time frame yet when you want to take this? Uh, I like that saying the virtual road show on a tour here or uh, with other organizations, or are you just beginning that stage right now? Thank you, Earl. We are, this was the launch of our road show, but we'll be, if you have ideas or suggestions, we would love to hear them. Um, I think probably this is something that we'll be working to, you know, roll out and, and, and sort of continue the drumbeat on over the next um, six to eight weeks. But of course, the tools will be available on our website whenever people want to check them out. And I guess the one other thing I will note that is if you do have ideas or suggestions of places where we could be sharing these um, opportunities to have another conversation or a presentation, we'll, um, we'll be pulling up our contact information um, as you guys close out of the webinar today. So you can contact us that way. We will also be following up with a recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides and our contact information is available in the slide deck. So please
please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I would love to get an email from you with uh, any feedback or, or ideas you guys all have. Erin, I see one additional question, and it's whether Families USA is going to be commenting on PDUFA um, and that this tool could be re really useful for that. Well, I guess you'd have to ask Families USA. Um, I think I know it can be confusing since I may I used to work at Families USA, but I'm at the National Partnership now. Erin, um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything you want to say about whether we whether the partnership is commenting on PDUFA at this stage. Um, thank you for the question, Jason. Um, I don't, I, Padufa is not currently on my immediate to-do list, but I have to admit, I was very focused on this webinar. So we'll, uh, I will take this offline and uh, chat with my colleagues and happy to round back with you um, separately. All right, I'm gonna put out one more call for any last questions or comments or feedback, either in the chat or um, raising your hand. But we know that you all are uh, busy, have, are, are busy, you've got important things going on personally and professionally. We are so appreciative that you took um, an hour out of your schedule today to join us and learn more about these choosing health equity um, resources and tools. Please check them out, share them with your, uh, your friends and family and networks. Um, we are eager to get the message out. So thank you again for joining us. Please let us know what you think when you have a chance to dig into them. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you offline.